All right, everyone, welcome, and we'll get started in just a few moments. All right, viewers, I'd love to welcome you all to the live stream for Cadella Forbes and Alex Weedle. Today, we're gonna to be discussing A Tall History of Sugar and Kamosha of the Caribbean, two incredible books that we are so pleased to welcome into Lost City Books. Um, but first, a little bit about us. If you are brand new to the store or you've never heard of us before, Lost City Books is an independent bookstore in the heart of Adams Morgan, Washington, DC. We specialize in new, used, rare and rare books. And since our renovation in 2020, we've been generating engagement and enrichment from the surrounding community, inviting artists, activists, organizers, authors, of course, and educators, many of which are reflected in our own staff from the area and from abroad, like we have today, to share their knowledge and skills and to talk about their incredible books. And I am your host for today, event manager, Shady Rose. I'm so very pleased to have you all here. Um, just as a note for viewers, you will have the opportunity to type your questions into the chat below the live stream and we will convey those questions to the authors today. So if you have any questions during the the discussion today, you can type those into the chat and we'll get to them towards the end of our live stream today. Without further ado, I'll present our authors for today. Cordella Forbes was born in Jamaica. She lives in Tacoma Park, Maryland and teaches at Howard University. She is the author of A Tall History of Sugar. Forbes is a professor of Caribbean literature and has published four previous works of fiction, Songs of Silence, A Permanent Freedom, Ghosts, and a children's book, Flying with Icarus and Other Stories. She began her teaching career at the University of West Indies, Mona, where she was also a writer in residence. Alex Alfonso Weedle is an award-winning Black British novelist of Jamaican heritage and has been described as one of the UK's most exciting writers. Weedle spent most, much of his childhood in a Surrey children's home. At 16, he was founder member of the Crucial Rocker Sound System and his DJ name was Yardman Irie. <laughs> That's very cool. <laughs> By 1980, Weedle was res residing in a social services hostel in Brixton, South London. He witnessed and lived through the 1981 Brixton riots, its precursors and aftermath. Weedle was briefly incarcerated following the Br Brixton riots. While serving his sentence, he read authors like Chester Himes, Richard Wright, C.L.R. James, and John Steinbeck. He has since been called upon to talk on the subject of the Brixton riots, most prominently in the 2006 BBC program, Battle for Brixton. His early books are based on experiences from his life living in Brixton as a teenager and his time in social services care. Weedle was awarded London Arts Board New Writers Award for East of Acre Lane. In 2008, Weedle was awarded the MBE for services to literature in the Queen's Birthday Honors List. Nice. <laughs> he is a member of English Pen. Weedle's debut novel, Brixton Rock, was adapted for the stage and performed at the Young Vic in July 2010. He wrote and performed Uprising, a one-man play based on his own life at Terra Art Studios, Wat Wats Wandsworth in London. Weedle lives in London. And without further ado, I'll stop sharing this, my screen and welcome you both to, um, to the discussion. Thanks so much for joining us today. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes we can hear you. Thank you for having yeah. us. Yeah, Absolutely. really great to be here with you. Okay. So I'd love to, to open the, the talk just by um, discussing sort of give our audience an idea what are the what are what are the the basic stories of each of your books where did the the story originate um and how did it make its way to the page 
Okay, uh, ladies first. Okay. <laughs> All right, I won't make any comments about feminist. <laughs> Thank you again, um, Shady and Lost City Books for having me. Um, thanks to the viewers out there for sharing with us today. I really appreciate you being here. Okay, so um, a tall history of sugar. Uh, so a story in a nutshell. So this guy is found as a baby, abandoned behind a hospital in a rural town in Jamaica in the late 1950s. And, and that is important because it's just before Jamaica's independence. And he's brought up by foster parents, um, Rachel and Noah Fisher. Uh, and he becomes a wonder. Uh, in a society where people don't easily marvel, both because they're so used to dealing with difference and um, and because they, you know, they, that means taking for granted in other places, probably the US as well, um, might, might be considered strange. The wonder of this guy, Moshe Fisher, is that he can't be placed racially. Nobody knows what color or race to place him in. Um, he seems to have no skin. I won't give you all the details. He seems to be split very evenly and oddly between Caucasian and African. You know, it's, and you'll see that from the part I'm going to read, that it's not simply regular mixture, but just split. And he's different in other ways that I won't go into. I hope people will buy the book and find the other ways. Um, but he survives both because of the society's ambivalence about him and because he finds a soulmate or soul twin, a girl called Arian Fisher, who actually becomes the narrator of the story. Arian Christie rather becomes the, she becomes Arian Fisher and she marries him. She becomes the narrator of the story. Uh, his attempts to deal with his differences take him on many journeys, including a journey to England in search of his father, whom he doesn't find, and um, to other parts of the world. And finally, back home, where he settles in a manner of speaking with Arian, his lover. And I say in a manner of speaking very carefully, <laughs> because it's very much in a manner of speaking that he settles. Um, you asked me how it originated. Uh, that's a hard one because the stories originate from many directions. Uh, what I would say is that um, at one level it originates from my, my love of love stories. It's very much a love story. And I think, you know, it's a book in which I, I went for the kind of book I, I myself most like to read. Um, it's also the book in which I, I write through the, the mythic dimension which I've been pursuing and which is just sort of, you know, you know very common in Caribbean writing so kind of sensibility. I think it's the one where I push the mythic dimension the furthest. And, um, but it's also socially and historically very situated. So that's important. So where it happens, um, you know, and when it happens, because it starts from the pre-independence moment in Jamaica and comes right up to the era of what I call Donald Trump and Brexit, you know, so, so that is important. And, and where it happens, a place that is marked by the legacy of sugar, are sort of very important for framing the, how the love story plays out or doesn't play out. But um, I, I, I will give a little anecdote about how this story came about in a more direct way. Um, I, I actually remember the moment I decided to write this book, and that's very unusual for me. I never remember where, when I start, but somehow I remember this one because I was reading an article, a research article here in the US, and it was actually shortly after I arrived, even though the, that moment began the journey, I didn't start the book until years later. But, but what I read said, that the first thing that people notice when they meet a person is a race. And I was really quite, you know, <laughs> taken and, and having lived with issues of race in the US for many years, that really, really got under my skin. And I thought, well, well, suppose you're somebody born 
whose race you couldn't tell, what then, what would you do? And, and that was what, so, so, so wrestling with that was the beginning of this, you know, of this story. And um, I thought actually it would have been set in the United States, but it isn't, it's set in Jamaica and England with some gestures towards the US. I think that's about it um, in a nutshell. <laughs> Compelling. Thank you, Alex. Um, I was re I was reunited back with my father in 1987, and he took me on a day trip to Port Royal. At this point, I didn't um, see um, my career as a writer back then. I I really wanted to be a DJ. I was inspired by the likes of Yellow Man and uh, the Lone Ranger and all those fabulous artists coming out from Jamaica. So. Um, but my father insisted that um, I go to Port Royal with him. And I never knew anything about it. I didn't know that it was the, um, the main hub of piracy uh, in the world. You know, yeah. so many people from all over the world went to Port Royal. And um, once I was there, they, were, they had a small museum there. I think it's still there, as I understand. And I read about the deeds of people like um, Captain Morgan, Calico Jack, and then um, I saw something about um, female pirates. One was called Mary Reed, one was called Anne Bonny. And that fascinated me. I thought, wow, uh, this must have planted a seed in my head because um, years later, I remember um, I wanted to um, write a narrative about the, um, the high seas because um, I was kind of annoyed when I watched those Pirates of the Caribbean movies and I was saying to myself, where is the black presence? You know, um, we're kind of invisible here. I think um, Naomi Harris played a cameo, but it wasn't really um, a strong character. You know, it wasn't really a strong presence. So I said, so I recalled um, my uh, visit to Port Royal and, uh, and reading about Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. So I thought, let me create um, a black female heroine. And so that is how Kamosha was born. And that um, part of history is really fascinating in the um, in the six in the later uh, 16th century when you had Captain Morgan and you had privateers and they would um, rob the Spanish main and uh, they would take anything that the Spanish tried to transport back to Europe. So it was a really fascinating, compelling time. And also, obviously, there were victims. Um, you know, you had your plant. Captain Morgan is one of the richest people in the Caribbean, and he had plantations around St. Mary. In fact, he had a residence uh, very close to Port Maria, and it was later taken over by the English writer Noah Coward. So that fascinated me. And on a later visit, my father took me there. And so I decided, let me uh, see if I can create a narrative. Let me uh, just build up a hero, because um, sometimes in uh, fiction, there's a lack of young Black heroes, especially in historical texts. And so I decided to start Kimosha on a plantation and she gets bought by, um, by one of Captain Morgan's um, crew. And she's taken to Port Royal where she serves as a barmaid and also um, he wants to sell her for prostitution. But uh, Kimosha has a strong spirit and uh, she denies that, she fights and she escapes and um, she ends up in the yard of um, of a barrel maker and barrel makers in those days are very, very important because if you traveled the, um, the high seas, if the barrels leaked, you could um, thirst to death, you know? So um, she meets with um, Ravenhide and Ravenhide teaches her how to wield a sword. And that ends up saving her life because she figures that the only way she can um, save her brother from the plantation is by raising enough pieces of eight and going back to buy freedom. So that is why she joins Captain Morgan's ship and she sails to, she sails to Panama. There's this legendary sacking of Panama City. I think it was, uh, my memory serves me well, 1668. So um, Kimosha sails to Captain Morgan and what she sees horrifies her, but um, on her return, she makes enough pieces of eight to see if she can um, bargain the freedom of her young brother. And so really it's written in the, um, the style of an old adventure story. 
kind of like Treasure Island, you know, I wanted that kind of adventure spirit in it. And Timothy is a brave heroine. Sometimes she makes um, uh, questionable choices, but her spirit's good. And um, for me, what I'm trying to do is just present a real, a really cool, brave um, black heroine hero that young people could read about and old people can read about and be inspired by her. So it was a pleasure creating her and I hope that um, she sells on more ventures. Thank you both. Um, something that I've noticed about, about each of your books um, uniquely is that they have the makings and, the, and the, all of the elements and trappings of what you would call a classic, right? Um, with A Tall History of Sugar, we have this epic, beautiful love story. And with Kamosha, you have like this classic adventure. Um, and often when uh, it's, you know, Black stories and Caribbean stories that are being told, the, the term classic is not even usually applied, right? So I wonder if either of you have thoughts on, on the elements of each of your stories that, um, that create that classicism, classicism, <laughs> And that um, that can appeal to to the reader of, of the classic as well as the a contemporary reader. It's a it's a very good question because who decides what text or book or narrative is a classic? You know, is it us deciding that, or is it other people deciding that? Um, and so uh, I remember reading um, books about Achilles, uh, the, the Trojan War, and so on, and about those heroes. And um, I was thinking, oh, you know, why can't um, our heroes be involved with uh, in classic literature? Why can't they be perceived as uh, classical uh, stories just as much as, um, if you like, the, um, I, can't, I cannot remember the name of the war, the Trojan War, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the name of the book, but you see my point that um, those stories and legends are lifted, they're elevated to classical status. So why not ours? I mean, um, my previous book was about Chief Taki. Uh, I know there's a movement in Jamaica right now uh, they're trying to establish him as a national hero. And for me, he's a, a, a mythical, classical figure. And so sometimes we, uh, we, we should embrace our past and embrace our heroes, you know, our forefathers and our ancestors and so on, and elevate them and write about them. So, um, and they should be equally seen in my eyes, in my opinion, as heroes. Like Alex, I, I have the I have an, an issue with the word classic as well and with it with classical. In fact, my children know that you know when I play music, I'm saying this is European classical or this is Chinese classical, and I say jazz is America's classical. So I'm you know and I'm I really don't know the basis on which people say classic. Like um, my my first book, Songs of Silence, was just republished as a Caribbean classic, but I wasn't asked what that meant. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But, but, but I know that, you know, there are publishers like um, People Tree or so on who are, and, um, who are moving towards this idea of, you know, here are, here are classics, you know, and, and republishing some fiction. So yeah, it surprised me that it was harder that um, did this Caribbean classic thing. So, so maybe... Yeah, but, but I don't know what it means <laughs> to be truthful, I wasn't asked. Um, yeah, I, I think though that, um, yeah, the, I can't say why at all History of Sugar would be considered a classic. People have said some very nice things about it. Um, I've been interested that, you know, like some readers and critics have said it's a, it's a golden mine for people who love fairy tale dimensions or love stories and it's cross-generational you can read it across generations that kind of thing um but i think in the end it is readers you probably have to ask <laughs> ask what they what they mean by that yeah absolutely um and like a part of the definition of a classic sometimes for some people will mean that it has historical elements to it and you know, it's a it's not just about the present day mm -hmm. um and something that both of these these books have in common is that they're writing about an incredibly pivotal and sensitive time in the history of um mm -hmm. the african diaspora across the world especially through mm -hmm. um 
mm-hmm. between the transatlantic slave that, um, that contribute to the, the setting for each of these stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you so say I'm, that because- I'm curious about just, um, so. what kinds of relationship you, please, yeah. Um, can, I, can I just piggyback on what you said and say something that really interested me about the connections between Alex's book and mine? And um, his is set in the days of well, days of slavery, you know, and mine um, references that history because I think we ask different questions on that continuum, which is of course a continuum with many forking paths. But I was really struck by the ways in which they both are situated in that sense, though mine is at a different time, a little, but it's still they're both situated in in that what I call that moment of the advent of modernity and, you know, modern and, and, and the place, you know, the Caribbean where that happens, that, you know, this is where modernity begins with the history of the African diaspora. You can't talk yeah. about modernity at all without looking at its foundation in plantation slavery and the co- and colonialism. So that's, that, that's it, you know, um, so, so I, I was really struck by that, and so yes, it's a it's a big question that you that you Absolutely. raise in my mind. Yes, and ultimately, then it has to be about you know what it means to be human and and that. Yeah. So I like that that connection. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, for me, what is important is that um, Kimosha, she has her own agency. I mean, yes. we all know the slave narrative that. Obviously, uh, ancestors suffered under the whip and so on, but not, I feel not enough is written about those who tried to challenge that, who tried to um, empower themselves and tried to free themselves. I mean, the Caribbean, wherever you go, uh, I was in Barbados a few years ago, and there's a, um, there's a memorial about the slave revolt there near the harbor. And that really heartened me because sometimes these stories are hidden. And uh, when I went to Jamaica and I did my research, I, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, there was almost slave uprisings every week. It happened on a almost daily basis and very little is written about that or it's not really factored in to, um, to the story of Jamaica. It's all about um, sugar plantations, uh, people getting rich and so on. But no, it's, um, it's far more than that. And so really what I wanted to do is uh, give um, my characters some kind of agency in control of their own destiny. That was very important to me. And I feel that's important for our children to uh, absorb and learn and say, wow, you know, look what our ancestors tried to do. You know, it's for me, that's very important rather than, you know, we're always kind of seen as a victim in many ways. And um, I mean, just, um, it, just in 2016, um, the so-called liberation of the slaves from the British, um, the uh, the slave, the uh, the slavers were given twenty million pounds, and this is in eighteen thirty-three. And so, you know, uh, adjusting for inflation, you're talking billions of pounds, and the slaves got nothing. Of course, the Americans have their own narrative. Where was it? Forty mills, and I cannot remember the name. Forty mills in an acre. Is that is that correct? For uh- a mule and 40 acres. <laughs> a, a mule and 40 acres, yeah. So, um, so again, um, and the British over here, they tried to deny the horrors and the appalling atrocities of slavery. You know, I did my proper research and, uh, you know, what happened on these plantations. And, um, and so the reader is left in no doubt when she reads about Kenosha, what would happen to her if she just submits and just let these people do what they want to do with her. You know, it's, it's, it's appalling. So, yeah. and we need heroes to fight back against that. I, I feel in, in our fiction, you know, to give that other half of the story that Dennis Brown used to sing about, that I used to love when I was a youngster. You know, what about the half that's never been told? And so that is what I'm doing with my fiction, writing the, um, the half that's never been told. It, it, Alex, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm thinking that I'm hearing myself talking in my classes. <laughs> I thought I was going to talk about my teaching. <laughs> oh my God, this sounds so much like me. And um, 
you know, I, I, I've all, I was thinking about um, one of the issues that Shady raised and she, in her email to me, and I was thinking about, you know, where Caribbean literature is going now. And I, one of the things I thought about was that we don't usually write slave narratives. And um, there has been, you know, recently a whole lot of books set in that period. And I said that, you know, they break a wall. These are narratives of freedom. Um, the idea of the victim is something that has never sat well with us in the Caribbean at all. You don't see it in any of the writing, <laughs> you know, this thing of the struggle, the struggle and, you know, the victim, the victim, we don't go there at all. It's always an agent. And I think about that a lot when I think about the reception of my work. Sometimes people ask me questions about victimhood and I'm saying, but it's not there. <laughs> it's not in my book, you know. So, so the, I think this the agency, the, the 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 dignity of the human is 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 very crucial. And I think that story is 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 it. You know, it's it's the history that that's that's a classic history, uh, the history of our agency and self making, as it were. Um, during that period, as you as you talked about the, the slave uprisings, they, in the Caribbean they actually made slavery ungovernable. You know, and that's that's why you know so you know, that, that's how emancipation came about. Yeah, it was a huge, right. it was a huge element in the emancipation Absolutely. in the British. They, they just you know it was just no longer lucrative because it burned down those plantations so yeah. so often. You know, absolutely. Yeah, of course. They tried to. Um, mm -hmm. They tried to um, build up William Wilberforce as the main, as the main person who abolished slavery. But no, yeah. no, it was they were forced to, as you rightly said. Yes. And so yes. this is the world that um, Kimosha is uh, yes. living, where um, her small actions, you know, have contributed to yeah. um, the abolishment of slavery in, in later years, because this was happening all over the island. People tried to escape, tried to confront, tried to challenge. And that's very important. And I believe, I strongly believe this, is part of the Jamaican DNA. Um, yes. A any Jamaican I've come across, even those who weren't born there, they have this, um, they have this resistance to authority or somebody telling them what to do. I noticed that in all Jamaicans. It's there, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in our blood. And so sometimes I do believe that uh, that resistance is passed down in our DNA. And so for me, um, and, you know, usually uh, we like to see our heroes as male, you know, strong males, but you had to have strong women and females. You had to have that, otherwise it wouldn't have worked. This resistance would not have worked. The uprising and so on, you know, women, had, played a role in that, they had to. So I'm just trying to honor that with Kamosha. Yeah. That, yeah, that, that's also the reality that the historians are talking about as well. Yeah. Your mute. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was struggling to get off mute there. Um, yeah, and something that is especially striking with with each of your your books too is that you you instill that agency and that that um, something you said, uh, Alex, was that uh, Kamosha is an agent, and um, those these characters are so filled to the brim with with utter humanness. Um, so I would love to hear each of you talk a little bit more about um, how you developed these characters. You know, if they were inspired by any real life people, for example, or if you created a set of values and experiences that you just wanted to instill into these characters um, and how they um, how they became kind of flesh and blood through through the writing. I guess. Um, yeah. OK. Cool, you go, you go. Go. go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Um, just the, um, the women in my family really, um, their spirit, their um, never say die kind of um, approach to life. You know, I've got a, a number of aunts on both my um, mother's side and my um, father's side. And many of them are very determined people. They've had their ups and downs, you know, sometimes they've been laid low. 
sometimes uh, it seems like they didn't, they couldn't go on, you know, because life can batter you, as as we all know, for various reasons. But um, somehow they got up on their feet again, and they and they got up and moved forward. And so for me, that was a big influence on me, and uh, obviously the creation of somebody like Kenosha, because for me, she's she's exactly the same. She has many uh, blows in her life. You know, she's uh, she lost her mother very young. Um, and uh, the only family that she has is a young brother and she's torn away from him. And for me, that has been our existence, hasn't it? Especially the female existence in the Caribbean where children were torn away from their parents and their mothers and so on. You're torn away from family. How do you cope with that? How do you deal with that? And so that was inspiration that led me to um, create Kimosha. You know, just to honor that um, that Caribbean female spirit, if you like, it's still there, very much still there. You know, um, many of us are still struggling, you know, trying to adjust to life and so on. So, um, and it's hard. Life is hard sometimes. So for me, it's uh, um, you could relate commotion struggle to to very much today. You know, when I go back to Jamaica, when I go downtown and I see the poor parts and so on, I think of that, you know, uh, of these women always struggling along trying to make ends meet, trying to survive, you know? So Kamosha comes from all of that, you know, she's created out of all of that. I think it's always true that you, that whatever you write is based on people you know, it, it, you know, it, it filters through the years, just into your DNA really. Um, I'm always amused when I, you know, we have to put the, the little thing on the copyright page. Any, any resemblance to any characters, real characters, is purely accidental. This is a work of fiction, <laughs> you know, because you know, there's so much of the people we know in, in what we write and so much of ourselves as well in, in what we write. Um, I, uh, the tough, the tough woman in, in at all, well, there are many tough women in at all history of sugar. The real toughie is um, Ariane and she's, she's a force to be reckoned with. I, um, um, I, I, it's, it's, that's how the people I grew up with uh, are. are. The, the thing about it though, is that, um, is, I want to go back to something that I'd forgotten to say. It sort of flowed off my mind because my mind does things like that. Things just disappear and then they come back at the oddest moment. Um, as you were talking about that, that fight and that resistance and agency, um, one of the things that, that mattered to me a lot is that we, I think, a lot of the a lot of the people I've met in in the I've lived around in the Caribbean. This is a kind of and in Jamaica, it's a kind of general um, what do you, character, if you like. You know, you say there's a, a national character or a communal character, and you know there are exceptions, but as in terms of the, the, the general character, is that they're not always resisting. <laughs> you know, they're not always fighting anybody. Sometimes they're just living their lives self-referentially. You know, it, it, they're not always answering anybody back. And that to me is, is the most human, wonderfully human thing. You know, that it's not that somebody else is speaking and you become a reply. So they then become God. Because I always say, if you do that, or if that's what you're doing all the time, it's as though you, you have never become quite human. You're always bent in the body of this, you know, of, of what people see as the slave. So, so... The, the ways in which they wrestle with the with the, the history and the legacy that history has left them, but at this you know, but living their lives as people, you know, you know, is to me one of the most wonder. They're always looking over their shoulders and say, "Oh, see some slave, and slave, or see some white person there," and, and that I think is the most wonderful thing. And I've tried to, you know, make you know to represent that. Yeah, in I this, guess in, in my in my books as well, but but certainly the resistance part of it, they will fight you. <laughs> you know? yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. of course, it has to say, true. they'll fight you. Yeah, as you say, you have to have that resistance, but also as you as you uh, um, refer to, you have to strategize too to survive. Sometimes you have to pick your moments, don't you? Sometimes um, you have to pick your time when to speak, when to resist, and so on. You have to play that kind of waiting game sometimes. 
for your very survival. And Komocha has to learn that. So that's an essential factor in our survival over the years. I was very interested when you said she made some questionable choices. I love that because we're not writing ideal characters. We're not romanticizing people, you know, the, the right to be, you know, not to be superhuman, just to prove you're not so, so subhuman is, is the, you know, just to be, you know, I, I, I like very much that you said that, <laughs> you know. She's, she's 15. I don't know anybody at 15 who always made the right choice. <laughs> Hopefully uh, readers can relate to that. I don't make the right choice now and I'm 59. <laughs> ditto, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder for I example have... why. <laughs> yes, anyway, go ahead. Yes, Shady, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to uh, remind our viewers who are watching right now that if you'd like to ask a question from the authors, you can leave it as a comment in the chat and we'll get to that in just a few moments. Um, and this, this conversation is so great. I, I love how many commonalities we're drawing um, and so many um, historic threads that are, are woven through this conversation. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to ask each of you if you would be interested in reading a short sample of each book so that we can um, kind of talk about, talk about the feeling of the book and talk about the, um, the reading experience of it as well. I'm happy to read. Okay. So should I? Please. <laughs> I, mean, I said okay and then they were silent. Yes, please. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, if, I, if I go on too long, stop me, please, Shady. But... Um, I, and I want to read from this section where Moshe is in London, is in England. He's sort of wandering around aimlessly as many to find the father. And um, so he meets this woman in a graveyard in Kent. And there's a kind of connection. He's feeling a bit guilty about her because he's an artist and he wants to paint her. And if he's as though he's reduced her somehow to just the painting. You know? But anyway, so um, I'm just going to get it sat in the middle of it. Um, can you hear me properly as I'm doing this? Okay. It's always nicer to come by myself, sit a bit quiet, sit a bit quiet with our shell. His companion had got up off the tomb by herself and he took her toad. She sat heavily on the next grave across from him and began rocking herself to and fro while she got her wind back. He could hear her breathing asthmatically as if she had just finished running. Are you all right, mommy? He was half turned toward her, his left hand still pressed over his shirt front so she couldn't see the blood. What's that? Sorry, it's a title of respect in my country. And which country is that? You don't fool me, dearie. I know you were just playing with me when you said Hungarian. Hungarian was your idea, mommy, or their parts where he's talking in his head. Not Polish either, she complained, but seeming caught up in the riddle she had set herself to solve. Nobody in those countries says mummy. I was only translating mummy, mother, madre, mater, mommy, miss mama, mom, mama in a thousand languages, Rachel. Don't take me for a fool, dearie. I would never do that, mother. Are you sure you're all right? The voice had regained its balance. The wheezing quieted. Yes, yes, just a twinge from the kneeling down and getting up sudden. Happens sometimes I come over queer. But I try to be careful. I don't know what poor Brampton would do if anything happened to me, now that it's just the two of us. Is Brampton your husband? He asked politely. And because he felt that the question was too personal and he ought to offer something of himself in return, I come from Jamaica in the West Indies. Her gaze on him went sharp. Confusion was on her face, taking in the clotted cream hue of his skin, the mismatched colors of his eyes, and the shiny straw bangs so at odds with the uncompromisingly black features that those features were rendered ambiguous. You don't look like any of those I've seen. An odd expression crept into the voice, and I have seen some. You're not a black? This last was half a statement, half a question. I suppose so. In truth, I do not know. 
He added gently, I am sorry I teased you about being Hungarian. Where I come from, not everybody is black or looks black. No, but not everybody is mixed up in such a way that the pieces don't come together in any way that makes sense or form. He suffered the feeling of his own fraudulence in using a truth to sustain a lie, defending himself against the charge of homelessness that dogs the nightmares of those who are not at home at home. Is that so now? How is it? The voice held genuine interest. Jamaica used to be a slave plantation owned by the British. A lot of consanguinity went on between the slave masters and the slaves. Some of us came out red, scarlet as sin, and some even more pale. The memory from Arian broke into his mind. One of the many recalcitrant outbursts he had inserted in her history essays, triumphantly earning a zero for being again out of order and rude. She flushed brick red, the color of her multitubular scarf. It made her look like the Red Queen. I know Jamaica used to be the pearl of the empire. Rum, sugar, bananas, we imported. I remember there was a poem. How does it go now? She fished about in her memory, brought it up at last triumphant, like a sweet rescued from the bottom of a large handbag. Yes, I have it. Thou also, O land abounding in thy native nectar, that's a Roman sugar, something, 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 joining with gladness due. No more shall I complain you lie in the farthest reaches of the kingdom. No more will you be the last point of Anna's rule. Gaze now upon an English south. I see you in the middle of the world and the British Empire. That was from a poem we learned at school. I've mostly misplaced it now. Never was good at remembering recitation, but all Sheldon knew it by heart. He had a prodigious memory, our Shell, held on to anything he learned like a hawk. I don't suppose it's something you'd be familiar with. No, I don't suppose it is. They didn't teach that kind of way where I went to school. Not really, he said, marveling at the level of ignorance and folly that was as familiar to him now as bread after three years of hearing the white English people talk about black people. Familiar, let it never fail to make him speechless with astonishment and something approaching pity. Years later, rereading his letters, Arian found the right words for his astonishment elsewhere. In one of the many books of others, she had ravaged for words. How does a person get to be that way? The woman understood his statement as an admission of deficiency in his education. He could see the triumph in her eyes that showed she felt vindicated. Her pride had been salvaged from the blow dealt it by his quip about slaves and slave masters, which had not been a quip at all, but the truth. You were going to tell me about Brampton, he said, to deflect the moment, both because he felt bad for her and because he was curious, giving himself more time to sketch her in his mind. He could afford the time after a whole morning exploring the village. He had nothing in particular left to do and nowhere in particular to go. You don't look familiar that way at all, though. She had shifted gears again, still caught up in the mystery of his appearance. And I've seen some. Now, I know I don't look like anyone I know. The face his mother had seen on him the day she rescued him from the ants and maca bush had not been a black face. This was the last thing she had given him except her tears, the day he went to tell her he was going to London. A prayer and your face disappear, she had said, and you get a new face, not like the one I find you with. I think if you had that face, you couldn't live among with. What face, he cried. Mama, tell me. But nothing he could say would make her reveal more. I think it won't come back, and then you will know. That is what my spirit said to me to tell you. Be patient, son. Everything coming its time. But mama, suppose it helped me to find somebody in England. Hmm. If you're to find him, you will find him. Don't worry. Yeah, we go with you, my son. Had he been found deformed? Would he return to his deformation? All his life he had been surrounded by mad people. His mother the worst of all. But it was no use. He would have to wait for the day when he would look in the mirror and see that like Gregor Samsa, he had turned into a cockroach. Then he would know once and for all. Fewer mad people. And now here was another one in a graveyard in Ramsgate, Kent, England, north of the River Stow, talking to a duppy in his grave. And they say only black people fool. Was our shell your son? At last he responded to the gentleness of his voice, as people did when they heard him. 
his voice that was gentle, but not because of any feeling inside him, but because of the trouble of speech, which he had learned to modulate by speaking softly, the words barely touching the sides of his mouth. And yet his spirit was gentle and retiring, though it had nothing to do with his voice. No, he's my brother, she said, speaking in the present tense, as if all Sheldon was still alive to her. He died young, you know. I took care of him when he was little. Our mom got sickly after he was born, never came back to herself. So I took care of him being the oldest and the girl. That was how it was in those days. If you were the oldest girl, you looked after the others. He grew up in my hand, so to speak. Our mom, one more to add to this store of words for mother, grew up in my hand, so to speak. I didn't know people talk like that here too. That's how we say it in my country, grew up in my hand. I grew up in Rachel's hand. He didn't have to ask what our Sheldon had died of. He had read the inscription. I'm gonna skip that part because time is going. But the inscription says that the guy died, the brother died serving his country against the enemies of the empire and the Guyana territory, West Indies. And he died of dysentery. It had seemed natural to choose this particular grave as his seat in response to the leaping, if ironic, sense of recognition that this soldier had died in a place that was his Moshe's own, not Jamaica, but still West Indies. And of course, in England, one became West Indian. Here, everyone from all the former colonies became a person from the West Indies, not Jamaica or Guyana or Barbados or Antigua or Trinidad, but West Indies, West Indian, as soon as one's feet touch English soil. The irony of the fact that this soldier had died fighting a war of oppression against the Guyanese people simply made Moshe's recognition of the dead man keener. The soldier had been very young, barely 21 years old, Moshe's own age when he died. Moshe had imagined him eager-eyed, bold and afraid with all the world before him, bright in his new soldier's red uniform and black helmet with plumes, his English red coat uniform, maybe he had a girl, maybe not. But surely he thought of himself as a hero going too far away to serve his country. And then he died so fanfarelessly, so without okay, okay, yeah, okay. So without trumpets and without honor, emptying his bowels on soil sheets in a tent, without a single shot being fired either by or at him in that distant place that he had known nothing about, at least not anything he would have thought worth knowing, and whose people he knew nothing about at least not anything about the kind of people they were. The sympathy he felt for this soldier, who had not known him and would not have cared if he had, seemed to skip over all the history that made them enemies. His heart pulled to this strange feeling of kinship with a youth he imagined bold, eager-eyed and afraid, maybe having a girl, maybe not, dying with ignominy in a soil tent, in an unknown place, in a cause he probably had no idea about at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was so beautiful. Uh, that makes me so excited for, for our viewers and for our readers to, um, to be able to read this entire book. Um, I want to give Alex the opportunity also to read a section of, um, of his book too. And then I would love to talk about these two sections with you, uh, with you both. And of course, I'll remind our viewers that you can leave your questions as a comment in the, the comments of the live stream and we'll answer those at the end of this section here. Okay, um, <clears throat> the extract I'm about to read is when um, Kamosha has escaped from her master at the tavern in Port Royal and she has met Ravenhide and she has been tutored under him in the art of um, swordplay. And Ravenhide has an idea. He believes that um, he could win her freedom if she can um, defend uh, herself against uh, Mr. Powell's sword. And so Raven Hyde takes um, Kimosha to the tavern to offer a challenge. He pushed through the door ahead of me. I followed him in. Smoke curled around me. I could barely lift my eyes from the floor. Drink fumes attach, attacked my nostrils. The tavern was packed. Groups of men gambled in opposite corners while two men groped a one-legged mulatto girl in the shadows. Others chanted their strange chants. Some only had eyes for their mugs and tankers. I lifted my head, seeing Indica behind the counter serving the seven-fingered customer. Another girl was beside her, drying a mug. She looked younger than me, her face bruised. 
Mr. Powell was behind her, a chill, colder than night. Hold cold in the night rain spread from my good heart and reached down to my toes. I found myself puffing hard. I closed my mouth and breathed through my nose. The grip of my sword tightened. I heard mocking laughter and cruel comments. Hear all, Raven Hyde suddenly shouted. Hear all. All eyes turned on him and bent to me. I have found your black strumpet, Raven Hyde announced. First, Mr. Powell glanced at me. When his eyes narrowed and glared, disbelief marked his forehead. The night man of the barrels, he shouted. A long time since you have bought rum from my tavern or even bartered for a mug of water and you claim you have found my black strumpet. I say you have given her shelter. He went for his sword, leaped above the counter and rushed towards me. The crowd backed away as he waved his blade high in the air. I was too shocked to move. Before you take the life of his slave strumpet, Raven Hyde said, stepping between me and my onrushing owner. Is she really a fair challenge to you? What sport is there if you kill her so easily? The black witch fled from my ownership after wounding Mr. Marsh, Mr. Powell raged. Her liver is mine to now where I choose. I bartered five pieces of eight for her. Five, will you compensate me? No, replied Raven Hyde. But if you kill her now, you will never recover those pieces of eight. The tavern hushed. Men paused their drinking. The mulatto girl managed to free herself from the two men and fled with her crutch. I heard her hopping over the cobbled stones. Ba-pum, ba-pum, ba-pum. I concentrated my gaze on a red stain on the floor. I spotted an ant scurrying to a corner. May I present a challenge, Raven Hyde went on. You dare present me with a challenge? Mr. Powell responded. Insolence. It could increase your fortune and luck, said Raven Hyde. And if you win, it will make me the poorer. Mr. Powell considered his options. He flicked his one eye at me. Me can't take this. I says, yeah, save me good self. Me heart going to bounce out of my chest. Name your challenge, Mr. Powell said with his voice raised. Raven Hyde hesitated. Doubt crept into his eyes. His lips moved, but no words were spoken. He coughed, placed a hand over his mouth and steadied himself. Maybe him finally realized me can do this. Name your challenge, Mr. Powell repeated. If you can part her black skin with your sword and make her blood flow before a count of a hundred, Raven, Raven High said, then there will be no price for the bells I make for you for a year, nor any other work you might desire for me to perform. The sword loosened in my hand. A strange feeling grew from my feet to my stomach. My forehead was suddenly wet with hot sweat. I felt my heartbeat on my forehead. I couldn't look up. Someone laughed. Others joined in. A count of a hundred, said Mr. Powell. You jest at me, Raven Hyde. The laughter grew louder. What say you, challenged Raven Hyde. Do you accept my challenge? Brave quartermaster of Captain Morgan himself, one who has conquered the Spanish main and walked its sands. I lifted my gaze. Mr. Powell glared at Raven Hyde. He scratched his chin and chuckled with an evil pleasure. Behind the counter, I spotted Indica with hands on her, hips shaking her head. She wasn't impressed. The young girl with the swollen face only had eyes for the floor. Give the black strumpet a chance, called a man from a corner. What have you to lose, shouted another. And if, bustling fortune, said Mr. Powell, that the black strumpet manages to defend herself for a count of a hundred, what do I lose? Without hesitation, Raven Hyde answered, you lose the five pieces of eight you paid for her. She wins her freedom. Indica shook her head. If she wins, you better find me another who can cook and scrub in this God-cursed sun. Your gambling will be the death of me. Mr. Powell rubbed his chin once more. He gazed at his sword and smiled. I accept, he said. I think what blood I had in my legs had escaped me, for I could barely stand. I held onto Raven Hyde's arm. He whispered into my ear, remember what I taught you. You're not fighting him. You're defending against his sword. His blade is your enemy. Be a skinny target. I wanted to be a target that was plenty miles away. Outside, someone yelled, outside. Raven Hyde led me through the tavern's front door. 
an arch of an orange sun still shone above the western hills. Not only did this tavern empty, but other places of drink too. There must have been over a hundred and a score men, all eager to see my death. Maybe two hundred. They ranted and cursed. They had taken their mugs and tankards with them. They puffed in their pipes and sniffed their tobacco. A few women were in the crowd too. I saw the one-legged mulatto girl watching from behind a horse and cart. They made a circle on a cobbled road for the duel. Some climbed on shacks and low-level buildings on both sides. This will be quick, said one man. The strumpet won't last the first plunge of a sword, said another. It's better entertainment than seeing a strumpet waste away on a gibbet. Gripping my shoulder, Ravenhide whispered into my ear, think on all we practice, only have eyes for his sword. Turn off your ears to the crowd. Unlike me, they haven't seen how swift you wield your blade. I'll finish there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that was very thrilling, a very thrilling excerpt. <laughs> um, I think it can definitely draw someone into um, to, uh, to the story, kind of jumping in and in the middle, so to speak. And um, we have a few more minutes, so I want to take some time to um, ask you both about those excerpts that we that we just heard. Um, Cardella, something that you mentioned earlier when you were talking about about your your uh, writing process for a tall history of sugar was that um, inevitably you would include just a little bit of sort of mysticism, a little bit of um, that subtle uh, subtle mystic element, and I did notice it in the. Um, in the excerpt that you read. So I'd love to hear if you could tell us a little bit more about maybe some of the folklore or some of the inspiration um, for, for those elements of mysticism that-, that... Um, I don't know if I would call it mysticism. I, 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 wrote, I wrote the book through what I call, is a very unsatisfactory vocabulary that I actually, I always find that I have to wrestle in vocabulary, but I, the, the nearest I came to it is, I don't know, oh, mythic, and I'm very dissatisfied. I mean, I said I get vexed with myself. But, but the whole book is framed through what I, I think of as a kind of Caribbean um, way of seeing the world, a very Jamaican way of seeing the world where, um, if, you know, the, the historical is not at all separate from the from the metaphysical where, you know, there's no such thing as uh, an other world. The other world is already part and past. You get people talk every day, like they say, you know, my, my mother is dead, for example, and they say my mother dreamed me last night. And that's perfectly common. So, and I think it is part of a way we think because it's part of how our, you know, people who have gone through that kind of experience historically that, that the diaspora went through have survived, that you see the world um, in dimensions that are bigger than what any, any anybody can, can, you know, any action that any, any human being can, can put, that there's something larger, which you might call spirit, which is inside you, but it also, the world is not bounded, is not neat boundaries between worlds, as it were. And, and we live that kind of way every day, you know? Um, so, so it's not so much in between like bits and pieces. I think it's the very ethos of the book you know that it's written in that kind of way um he's talking about you know where he comes from there's a lot of talk about the history um but he's sweating blood because arian has malice him she hasn't written to him you know and um he's and that that's that that way of writing he's sort of very natural to because it's just how we you know we see the world kind of thing I don't know how else to put it in the sh because I'm talking fast in the moments that I left you know and I could probably frame it more precisely um but that's the best I can come up with now that there are no I'm not seeing boundaries between different ways of being or, or thinking um people have used different terms some people call it marvelous realism or magic realism and I don't like those terms because it makes it sound as though it's not the everyday stuff 
of our lives or the way we enter the world. And we're used to in between it is nothing goes in a straight line in that way. Um, absolutely. Thank you for that answer. I think um, it definitely comes through in, in the in the book too, just how every other mm -hmm. thought is um, mm -hmm. has that sort of just uh, as a matter of course, mythicism, you know, his mother talking about his face coming back or going, you know, going away and that just being kind of a surreal thing, but also just a very real concern. Is it going to come back? Is the my old face? You know, and I think that's... Uh, my, when I was with uh, her, I said to my, yeah, okay. I said to my mother, why is this guy that's walking thing. up in the sky? And she says, because, you know, River Mama stole him and kept him for 21 days and that's her mark and it, it total sense to me <laughs> yeah, kind of thing. absolutely um and conversely alex um in the excerpt that you read and i think it, this is uh, very true throughout the throughout the book um with kamosha is uh is a very concrete um experience of the moment in a way uh you know you you feel every drop of sweat that the character is feeling and every beam of heat and notice all of the things as the character is noticing them. Um, and I wonder if you, um, if that is an intentional choice to sort of root the, the reader in the sort of thrill of the adventure or are we, um, are there other reasons for those choices with the, with the writing? Oh yes, absolutely. I want to um, root the reader in the reality of Kimochi's situation. And so, um, we spoke before about uh, not making our heroes superhuman. And so I want the reader to actually feel her nervousness, her fear, her dread. And I want um, also the reader to feel um, the heat of that moment, the intense pressure, you know, uh, and the expectations laid upon her by Raven Hyde. So I'm taking the reader on a journey that comes straight from Kimonja's soul. I want the reader to feel every kind of, um, fiber of her being, if you like, you know, to uh, feel what it's like to be her and to fill her shoes. I think that's very important for a story like this, where you can immerse yourself in the character so much that you can identify with her. And uh, the fact that she is human, you know, she's um, headstrong, she's, um, she's fearful, she's um, quick to anger, she's thin-skinned and all these things. All these, all these uh, attributes to her, and uh, some, might, some might say negatives, they make her into a rounded human being. So even though uh, I've created a hero, he's a very human hero. And I want the reader to feel that and see that and experience that with her for this journey that she goes on. Oh, um, before I finish, um, could you, uh, in the chat, write, um, the shop's address so so I can inform my family members to uh, check your shop out. Absolutely. I will definitely do that right now. We're Thank Lost you. City Books um, on 18th Street in Adams Morgan. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. So we, uh, we don't have any comments in the questions in the chat here. Um, but I would like to take our last few minutes to ask you both to um, offer a few, a bit more information about where our viewers can keep up with you, follow you on social media, or look at your website to keep up with your work. Um, for me, I have a website, um, addictsweetle.com. Um, on that website is uh, my list of books, my articles, uh, everything else about me, basically. Uh, there's a gallery there, all kinds of information on me, uh, upcoming events and so forth. So, um, in fact, let me write it on the um, on the chat. So, uh, Shady, maybe you could um, uh, pass this on to uh, our viewers. Okay, there, there we is. go. And that is in the chat for you all to take a look at and you can click on the link there. Okay. And Cordella also. I'm afraid I'm a very retiring kind of person. So um, you'll find me on Facebook and you'll also find me sort of on Twitter and I'll, I'll, I'll write the, um, the Twitter handle here. I 
anything. So I forgot my even forget what my Twitter handle. I think that's it though. <laughs> that's, okay. That, um, yeah. Is that Twitter or um, Instagram? That's Twitter. Twitter. Facebook Twitter. Okay. is just me. You just find me on okay. Facebook. Yeah, on Facebook. Yeah. Sort of. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today. This has been such an incredible conversation, and I'm so pleased that I got to meet you and hear these insights into your work. Um, for our viewers, just so you know, we do still have copies of each of these books, A Tall History of Sugar and Kamosha of the Caribbean, available at Lost City Books. You can come into our store on 18th Street in Adams Morgan, or you can order them online, and uh, they'll be delivered to you. So. Thank you again, both of you, so much for joining us today. If you have any final words, now's the time. Just um, thank you for having us, for hosting us, and um, presenting our books and stocking our, our books in your store. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. And Alex, I love that reading. Thank you. Thank Loved you. yours too. Thank so hopefully we can do something live one day. I'm, I'm, yes, I think we can hopefully. arrange that. Because <laughs> I'll come over to Washington quite often, but and now the pandemic is hopefully easing. Oh, how yes, is the pandemic in, fact, in um, DC right now? Is it is it easing? It, it goes up and down, fluctuates. Everybody's terrified. I think yeah. you my convenient at the moment. I've reached a point where I, I sometimes don't listen so that I can actually breathe, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But you know, we we've been in Maryland. We've been very serious about vaccination and getting boosted. Right. So so that has helped a lot. I think and wearing our masks. Okay. Um, Shady, we thank you so much. You were wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, you all have a wonderful evening, a wonderful afternoon. And if you're ever in DC, Alex, let us know and we'll get together, at least have a coffee or something. Yes, we will do. Thank you very much. Good night.